Hello everybody, uh, this is the AAAF uh, Museum Showcase. Um, I'm just going to do some housekeeping introductions uh, before, before passing on to the chairs of the museum group. Um, because we've got so many people attending, uh, we've muted everyone uh, and also disabled chat. Um, so if you have any questions for any of the panellists, uh, for any of the chairs, if you can use the Q&A form uh, at the bottom of the Zoom form, uh, we, we should be able to see them and we'll be able to answer them. Um, during this IIIF week, uh, we've got a special Slack channel, and I'll put the URL to joining the IIIF Slack into the chat. Uh, and if you click on that, you can join it uh, and discuss the sessions and interact with uh, other people that are attending the conference. And all the recordings uh, will be emailed, uh, and we'll send them out uh, next week. So I'll now pass on to Richard. Great. Cheers, Ben. Uh, and thank you for getting this set up. And thanks to Meg and everyone at the consortium for getting the whole online conference going. Um, and thank you to everyone speaking and attending, given uh, everything that's going on in the world at the moment. Um, for anyone new to the calls, uh, a bit about the museum group, uh, the clues in the name, really. Uh, we discuss issues to do with trip life implementation in museums and galleries, uh, sometimes libraries and archives as well. We're all friends here. Uh, there's three chairs of the group, that's Tina at the Art Institute of Chicago, Emmanuel at Yale Centre for British Art, and myself at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, talks on the calls cover things such as implementation of IIIF, it's an institution, uh, building new features or functionality or, or updates on existing projects and applications. Today's session has one of each of those, um, luckily. Um, so let's get started with a talk from Adam Colson, who is a relative newcomer to IIIF at the National Museum of Scotland, and we'll be talking a little about his experiences, good and bad, with it. Uh, Adam, I think you can take over. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, definitely a newcomer. Um, so yeah, let me um, just start by giving you an uh, introduction and a bit of background on myself and the museums that I work with. Um, so yeah, um, my name is Adam Coulson. I'm digital product manager at National Museum Scotland, which is a group, um, one of the biggest museum groups in Europe. And uh, we have four sites across the central uh, belt of Scotland. Um, the biggest being the National Museum of Scotland, which is in Edinburgh um, with over 2 million visitors uh, each year. So um, my role with, um, with the with the museums is is really focused on our digital products obviously um and focusing on uh our collections and how we uh how we present them to the world so obviously um when i started getting interested in triple if um over the last couple of years since i've been at the museums um i was put onto richard um through the network and started digging a little bit deeper and reading more and trying to understand what on earth triple i f is <laughs> um as a as a non developer um a non i would class myself as a non techie person um uh, yeah it's it's been a bit of an uphill struggle to try and get my head around it to be to be honest um but we i was determined that we would try and kind of uh, do some small tests um and get involved and try and tap into the community and, and see what we could do um so I went to a session um, a couple of years ago to, to kind of get the get the gist of it and find out what, what the opportunities were. Um, and obviously, I'm sure we're, we're at quite a low level of, of kind of maturity, I guess, when it comes to IIIF, but things like the, the, the David Rumsey map tab browser extension, obviously that's a really cool thing. Um, and deep zoom functionality um, and being the, the, the key thing for, for us was the opportunity to try and unify some of our collections with other objects that were in other spaces, other galleries and museums um, and try and produce some cool content around that. Um, so the, um, when I came back from that session, um, obviously I was full of enthusiasm and excitement to, to go back to our kind of uh, our collections information team who kind of control uh, our, our systems and our infrastructure. And so I went straight to our developer there um, and was like, we've got to start doing something. What can we do? How, what, how feasible is this? Um, and 
uh, as 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 I'm sure we've all experienced, the the kind of the, the shutters came down uh, to 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 use a phrase. Um, obviously, uh, there's there was a whole kind of product backlog for the collections information um, side of the organisation, and uh, their focus was on the dam system um, and lots of other kind of priorities. And so uh, the ability to be able to try and play with triple IF and uh, integrate that into what we were doing was. I was I was given the impression it was at least a couple of years away. So, um, so we decided just to kind of uh, go for it and try some kind of low level experiments. Um, and so the the opportunity uh, came up towards the end of last year. Um, it was quite a timely one for us. So here, <clears throat> here in Scotland, um, you may have heard that independence is is an issue that uh, that doesn't go away. Uh, the idea of an independent Scotland. It's not an, a new idea. Um, and we were partnering with uh, the National Records of Scotland, another national institution here, who um, take care of, of lots of manuscripts and lots of um, items through our archive. Um, one of those objects was a, 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 a letter um, that was about to come up to its 700th anniversary, and that was for the declaration of our broth. Um, now, this letter was is known um, in Scotland as, as the, one of the first expressions of Scotland being an independent nation uh, from England and the United Kingdom. Um, so this was a hugely significant uh, anniversary here in Scotland. Um, and that anniversary was, well, took place in March of this year. So um, we partnered with National Records of Scotland and we were gonna do a display, um, quite a low level display due to the conservation um, implications of that, that letter, that document itself, uh, needing to to only be done on display for for a short amount of time under specific lighting so we thought how can we um maybe use triple if and and other tools to try and uh, present this online in a way that more people can see it than are going to be able to visit the actual object itself now um obviously the the situation around covid uh scuppered us we were about to go um live with that uh that display in the gallery space um at the end of march but that obviously got postponed so um what we did instead was we we used triple uh, if to produce like a deep zoom uh version online um which has been really well received so i guess my experience of of triple f in this particular instance is uh is that it was it was a really good way to try and pr uh, you know create a deep zoom function which i know there's lots of other tools to be able to do that but we really wanted to test out um triple if and, and give that a little try um and so we uh, initially going back to the end of last year when this this idea sort of first came around um i spoke to richard who uh i was i was put onto um by by someone else in my network who said you know, we're starting from scratch. I'm not a developer. I don't really know where to go for, for some advice. Um, Richard put me on some useful resources um, to try and find out uh, how easy or difficult that was to, to produce something in-house essentially um, for, for this particular letter. Um, so he pointed me towards the um, uh, Microsoft Expression uh, Deep Zoom Composer. Uh, to be able to sort of manipulate the the large TIFF file that we had of this this document, so um, I'll show you a, 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 an image of that just in a second. Um, and so that that tool allowed us to sort of cut it down, uh, run it through that little tool that cut that massive TIFF down into lots of small files and put them in folders. And then we then used Open Sea Dragon to be able to embed that um, image on on our website. Um, so the, the, the document itself, um, I will just try and pull that up on screen for you now, if I can try and share my screen um, to give you a bit of a sense of what that is. Right, okay, let's give this a try. Okay, hopefully you should be able to see that. So obviously, 700 years old um there's there's elements of the of the document that are missing uh, that have deteriorated over, over that time frame um there's lots of uh, what you can see at the bottom are seals uh these are um the barons um of scotland who who instead of signing the document would have affixed their seal onto onto the letter itself uh which actually was sent to the pope um and 
so it, it, it's obviously very delicate. Um, so what we wanted to do was to be able to show people the, the, the sort of texture and the, the intricacies of, of, of the, the parchment that it was made on and those wax seals that you can see there on screen um, at, at sort of deep zoom level. Um, so we were really pleased with how that turned out and it was something that we, we hadn't done before. Um, and so we've kind of come away from it thinking, trying to think up uh, some, some new ways we can, we can try it out. Um, so hopefully you can see that there. Um, so yeah, as uh, Richard sort of mentioned earlier on there, so I've, as, as an experience of working with IIIF, um, it, was, it was quite tricky, uh, to be honest, initially to get my head around the, the language um, and uh, the process uh, when, like I say, I'm not from a, a, a necessarily a technical side, so I did have to kind of lean on our internal developer to be able to, to, to walk me through the process, but I was really keen to try and understand just how um, repeatable that was and how easy it was to be able to spin up different versions. Um, so, so yeah, I guess from, from my point of view, the next steps for us are really trying to look at new opportunities to be able to, to take our use of IIIF further. Um, obviously this is an initial kind of test for us. Um, the, the, obviously the exciting thing with IIIF is being able to unify um, items from other organizations, other institutions across the world. And one, our kind of dream, if you like, uh, is, uh, is one of our key um, objects in our Scottish history and archeology span galleries is um, uh, the Lewis Chessmen, which are, are chess pieces, which um, uh, were made of uh, walrus ivory and discovered uh, in the Middle Ages on the island of Lewis. Um, now that's a collection of these chess pieces, which we, we have um, a selection of them at our gallery in Edinburgh, uh, but the a number of them are actually in the British Museum in London. So uh, I've not spoken to the British Museum about this, but there's just one example of how we might be able to sort of unify those in, in a virtual sense, potentially using IIIF. So um, yeah, we're really trying to uh, look at new opportunities and, and, and try and understand how we can grow our use um, beyond simply uh, the, the kind of smaller scale experiments. But, you know, it's been, it's been really interesting. Great. Cheers, Dan. Um, I'm just now looking to see if we've got some Q&A uh, questions, but I'll ask you one while I'm looking. It's now, now you're an expert. <laughs> what would be the most useful thing uh, that you would think a newcomer could have? To get going that you couldn't find i think the um a simple guide and i know that you, people will say that all the time um because it's not it's not a simple thing it's not a simple kind of uh, uh process and and language i think almost like a uh a, a, a dummy's guide in, in terms of the language and the, the terminology i think that was something that that it took me a bit of time to get my head around um and diagrammatically to be able to show, okay, step one, do this, step two, do this. Um, for, for the, for the non-technical, non-developer um, audience, I think that might, be, that might be useful. I'm not sure if that exists, it probably does. Uh, I think there are, and Glenn can probably say more about um, them, but I think in museums, we have a, the problem you've mentioned a bit about the, the individual systems problem at each institution perhaps is a bigger part of the issue you found maybe as well. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of information out there and I think, yeah, it's just trying to, trying to find the right bit for you, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, there's someone, uh, a question from uh, someone in the chat about, is there a guide and Glenn, I'm, I'm throwing that one over to you. Uh, there was a question about it. Can you put a link in the chat to the manuscript as well? I don't know if you... Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll drop that in just now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, so another question, uh, which was, uh, what was harder, making the images, organizing the server or organizing the viewer or all of the above? <laughs> um, well, the, the way that we, we did it at our side was I was the one that was kind of trying to edit the image. So that was, that was quite interesting. I quite enjoyed that process just to learn that myself. So that wasn't the most difficult piece once I'd got the right information about where to, to, to get the tool. Um, 
uh, organizing the server side of things. We do have like server access from my side, um, but we, we sort of rely on a third party to, to manage that. So I think that was, that was probably says more about our, our internal setup than it did about the, 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 the technicalities um, of, the, of that process. Um, but yeah, as a, as a complete beginner, I think it, was, it would probably be all of the above um, <laughs> given, given, given our starting point. Yeah. Um, you mentioned other things you would like to do with it. Is there anything you've already thought of, particularly with the manuscript or other objects? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, we, Richard and I, we've spoken um, br briefly about this, uh, you know, trying to, trying to suss out some opportunities. And I think half the, half the battle for us is, is the, the breadth and the depth of our collection um, and the material in it. So we, we, it's a good it's a, it's an opportunity in many ways, obviously, um, but it's not knowing almost where to begin. I think we, we have a, a big science and technology um, a curatorial kind of collection. Uh, we have natural sciences with huge numbers of records, but what we don't have is uh, we're not, we don't have a lot of documentation. So I think when a lot of the IIIF conversations that I've, I've been involved in or heard or, or read about, it comes from a sort of archival point of view around um, manuscripts, obviously, and, and, and documents. And so, which is why the, le the letter that, that I've just shown is, is relevant. But when it comes to objects, we don't have a lot of artworks either. So a lot of our objects in, in, um, at here in our, in our collections are, you know, it could be a car or it could be um, lots of different kind of big physical objects. So it, they're not necessarily things that have been dispersed or that other people have versions of. Um, so that's why the Lewis Chessman is the kind of the, the goal for us, because that's one of our, you know, most popular iconic sort of key objects that, there's that unification kind of idea uh, where to bring them together virtually would be wonderful. But yeah, yeah. anyone knowing anyone at the British Museum who'd love to do that, then, you know, please pass my details on. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, uh, and perhaps anyone else with any other objects in common, I think that, like you Absolutely. said, that's the, the great yeah. thing that you can bring them back together in the form. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, and absolutely. We're kind of just keen to, to look at opportunities across the board, really, um, uh, and just experiment more and, and learn a bit more about it. Yeah. OK, well, uh, if there's anyone else with a question, this is your last moment to type it in. I think someone has helpfully put a link into uh, one of a guy from Digirati that I don't know if you came across at all, Adam. But, um, oh. Uh, that no. also gives me an, an excellent segue into our next talk. <laughs> so uh, if there's no other questions, <laughs> right. uh, thank you for that. And uh, thank I you. hope uh, more features appear. And you might, I don't know if you've signed up, but the manuscript uh, group tomorrow has a call during the conference and they may have some features that you might uh, like to add on top of that manuscript on the site as well. So maybe another useful one. Uh, so more work for you is what I'm saying. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Cheers. Thanks, Cheers. Uh, so, uh, as mentioned, uh, the, the link uh, to a great guide there provided by Digirati and our next speakers uh, work for the uh, agency Digirati. Um, and they've been developing some software that uh, we've seen before on the museum group call. Group call and it's something uh, we at the VNA have been supporting the build of, uh, which is a new Triple viewer and manifest editor. Uh, so Kelsey and Stephen will be presenting the latest version of it now, but I'm not sure which of you is starting to talk first, so I hand it over to both of you. Thank you, Richard. Um, hi, everyone. I um, hope you're enjoying the Triple F week so far. Uh, as Richard said, my name is Stephen, and I'm joined by my colleague Kelsey, and uh, we work at Desiree, who have been working with Triple F for, for years now. Um, and we've got a team of developers that work in uh, on the various different uh, projects uh, among other things. You're a bit quiet Stephen, sorry if you can... Sorry, is, is Just that, right. yeah. <laughs> um, So for the last year or so we've been working with uh, the VNA to create some viewers and also uh, this editor and some tools. Um, so we're going to just show the, uh, the manifest editor and also some of the viewers that we've created. So just to give a small bit of background, um, we have some goals on the project uh, because we we know that there's the IIIF is quite a, a large space, so we want to bring something new. Um, so we wanted to 
present Triple F in sort of new and creative ways, um, especially with the new functionality of Presentation 3. Um, and additionally, we wanted a way to edit that in an easy way. So I uh, wanted to make sure that the Triple uh, F was accessible so that we can create uh, more and more of these different sort of experiences with Triple F. Uh, and lastly, just to also make it reusable um, while still being unique so that each of the objects that are uh, collections of objects that are being showcased uh, stand by themselves and can be viewed and appreciated. Um, so to achieve this, we built a manifest editor that allows you to edit sort of the three main parts of IIIF. Um, the, on the left there, you've got the, uh, or sorry, in the middle, you've got the canvas, which is uh, where the, the image is itself, or uh, as you'll see in a, a moment, maybe multiple images. Um, on the right hand side is the, uh, the text that describes the particular image that you're looking at and any other sort of metadata that's associated with it. And around uh, at the bottom on the left is the structure which sort of ties all of this together. Uh, that's the navigation through different images and also the, the annotations or the, the images that make up the single view in the center there. Um, so I'll hand over now to Kelsey, who's going to show you the, um, the manifest editor in a bit more detail and showcase some of the different things that it does. And then uh, I'll come back and show some of the, uh, the viewers that this uh, sort of drives. Okay, so I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I am going to just show you some features. As Stephen mentioned, we wanted to focus on being able to bring in a range of features um, from the presentation three of IIIF. Um, so what you're seeing here is a manifest editor. Um, on the left hand side, we've got a couple of annotations and you can see we've got in here an image annotation, um, which is one of these beautiful Balenciaga dresses. Um, and embedded into this, we've also got an a annotation, which is a YouTube video, which sits on, on top of the canvas. So um, here we've got a couple of different media elements sitting within one canvas and bringing that together within the manifest editor. So um, one of the focuses of the manifest editor is to allow you to create a new manifest and a new IIIF JSON document um, of a range of, of different um, collections um, and different um, bringing a variety of different IIIF annotations um, and canvases together into one place and building something new. Um, so here you can see um, the ability to bring in a new collection and pull that in and add that in as a new canvas into your manifest. Um, so here there's a couple of new uh, canvases being brought into the manifest and then you have the ability to reorder your manifest in a drag and drop way at the bottom there, um, just on the, the thumbnails panel at the bottom. So it allows you to not only create IIIF manifests as you go, but also have an idea of what that's going to look like to your end visitor experience at, at once it's all come together. So what you're seeing here is the v &A viewer, which Stephen's going to show you a bit more of later on, um, but this is a slideshow editor um, and it allows you to um, see in real time as you're creating it what the content is going to look like. So just as an example, um, the manifest editor is adaptable. This is the manifest editor being used by um, Delft University. And again, they are using it in a similar way, but here just to create some exhibitions. So the first thing that you see when you open up the manifest editor is the manifest view itself where you can edit the content on the, the right hand side so you can name the manifest and add any required metadata and on the right hand side um, and then from there you can add in canvases or 
um, really drill down into the annotation level and add detail from there. Um, here, what, what we're showing you is the v &A manifest editor has a couple of different editor modes. Um, so you can see it in slideshow mode or you can see the manifest editor with no extensions. Um, and there's also the option to create a canvas, which is a pins view um, or annotated zoom, which Stephen will show you an example of what that looks like on the viewer later on. Um, there's a couple of really nice functionality um, in the manifest editor, so it allows you to crop images um, and annotations really easily. So you can see on the right hand side here, you can deep zoom um, into an annotation image itself, set where you want it to go, and this will update onto the main canvas. And from there you can drag and make it a bit bigger if you wanted to. Um, and you can change your mind as many times as you want. Um, it just allows you to, to edit and crop. Say for example, your images were the wrong way around, which quite often happens. Um, if you are digitizing a whole collection, you're inevitably going to have pages that are in landscape and pages that are um, in portrait mode. So you might want to rotate them for the viewer. Um, and for your end visitor experience. So there's a way to really easily rotate the images as you go through. And likewise, part of the IIIF presentation three spec is to be able to grayscale your images. Um, so we've added functionality to allow you to be able to quickly flick between that and decide how you want that to look for your end user. So I'm going to hand back to Stephen now, who's going to um, show you what the viewers look like for the v that we've built. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, yeah, so the manifest editor, the output of the manifest editor is uh, IIIF manifests. Um, we do have sort of some extensions to the IIIF that allow us to change the layouts of pages or, or other things. But it is still IIIF, so these documents that are created can be viewed in the viewers I'm about to show you or stand alone in something like the Universal Viewer or um, in something like Mirador, um, including the, the annotations. So uh, the first viewer I'm going to show you is the first one we created, which is uh, shows an assortment of pins um, highlighting regions of interest. So in this view, the users uh, Sort of free to navigate around and decide where they want to uh, look at and find more detail about the, the content. Uh, and this can be a slide in a slideshow as well uh, in the manifest editor. So this, this is sort of giving the user the choice um, to explore. The second example um, is the same piece of IIIF, but in a different view, which uh, is a tour. And this takes the user around each of the uh, areas on the page in order, showing the information about each region. Um, and it is more of a, a guided tour. Um, so there, there is a sort of way to explore and have a click around. But this is more uh, intended for an experience where you want to show people this piece of IIIF in more detail, show individual sections or areas of interest um, where it might be missed if you're just uh, just zooming in and uh, looking at the image. Uh, and lastly, uh, I just want to show again the uh, slideshow that's the most recent uh, thing we, we've worked on um, that has a variety of different views um, and really sort of shows how you can take IIIF from many different places, perhaps different institutions, and bring them all together into another uh, new piece of IIIF um, without using sort of the interoperability that IIIF offers. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so the, 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 the slideshow itself can be composed of the pin viewer or the, the other views to um, sort of go into more depth onto a particular image as well, sort of zooming into describe different parts of the image. 
Uh, so I hope you've enjoyed a quick look at the manifest editor and the viewers at the, the other end of the manifest editor. Um, just to mention as well, these all work great on mobile too. Uh, I think there's a, there's a few examples of that, those uh, live on the v and um, And we're continually adding and improving the viewer. And I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks, Kelsey. Um, I'm not paying you to plug the v &A, but thank you for plugging the website as well. <laughs> um, uh, so there's, I've realised there's questions on the Slack channel as well that I wasn't looking at, but I think they're being answered. People are asking about links to the projects um, in the GitHub repo and on the Gujarat site. I don't know if you could put a link in the chat as well, perhaps, to a useful site to go to um, just for people on this call. Uh, I don't know if anyone has copied across. Uh, there's uh, culturalheritagedigerati.com if that's the most useful link to go to, would it be? Yeah, we'll have a look at that uh, and put a useful link into um, the IIIF chat. Okay, great. So um, I'll just check the question. I've realised I should be checking questions in multiple <laughs> things now. So, okay, here we go. Uh, is the manifest editor or even the viewer adapted for video sources? If not, are you aware of any that are? The um, manifest editor can handle video sources. Um, so at the moment it's set up to handle both um, sources from YouTube and from Vimeo. Um, the, this also works within the v and viewer as well. Um, you, can, you can handle video annotations in there. Uh, oh, uh, another question. Are there ways to import metadata images from a collections database into the manifest editor or is everything input by hand? Yes, so if you have a, a link to an existing IIIF manifest, um, then you can very quickly bring that into the manifest editor and just make any edits you want from there and then re-download. Um, or alternatively, you can use the IIIF Collections Explorer on the right hand side, um, which I demoed, um, and that allows you to only bring in part of an existing collection or an existing canvas into the manifest editor. So um, you can either bring in the whole thing or just one at a time if, if that's what you want to do. Okay. Uh, and uh, John has kindly put a good link in uh, to uh, the Q&A, uh, I think, to the manifest editor starting point, if that uh, is a good place to find out more about it. Yeah. Um, I have a, a question for like, what, what would be the new features, uh, what would be the greatest feature you would want to add into it? That's a difficult question. Though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can that one. Uh, uh, there's another question while you're thinking uh, from uh, Joe Pavfield about are there any restrictions on others using this software beyond the complexity of setting it up? Uh, no. Um, it, I think it's open source. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's open source, um, including the, the viewers um, and all licensed under MIT. So. Uh, and there, there are examples of uh, setting it up in different configurations, but it, it can be can be a challenge as with all things in AAA. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there any uh, um, setup guide in the repo? I haven't looked at the page, sorry, but is there a starting point or? Um, so the, the repo that you're seeing um, won't be the latest features that we've implemented. Um, we are working on it as we speak, working on it today, um, but we will open source it all once we're, we're done, I believe, um, and that will include a startup guide how to, how to get going with it. Okay. Uh, so chance for any more questions while uh, you still think of what amazing new feature you would like to add to it uh, holograms maybe that's always what we talk about i'm not quite sure what that would be um oh another question from joe are there thoughts on connecting it to a database for people to keep track of past manifests they create um maybe your best place to answer that stephen 
Sure, no problem. Um, so I, I think we've hooked it up to a back end of uh, the V&A, uh, actually. So um, we do have points for uh, the Collection Explorer to uh, link it to somewhere outside of the, ma uh, the manifest editor. Um, and it seems, yeah, it seems reasonable to, to have that sort of persistence um, where you can, your, your editor would be full of your things and the content that you most likely use. And um, so partially we already have and partially, uh, yes. I suppose that relates a bit back to uh, the problem in Adam's talk about that's where the individual institution systems come in a bit more and if you're building something that's generic it's quite there's a point where you have to, you can't there's a cut-off point where it can't be tailored to exactly for one individual institution setter yeah yeah true <laughs> um that's a, definitely a challenge we've had um but w one of the things that we we've always supported is um if you have a link to a piece of triple if you can chuck it in the viewer and start taking things out of it um, and composing things in triple F, which um, should make it as accessible as possible for uh, sort of the triple F community as well, for institutions that have that share their data through triple F. Um, the process of saving that triple F back is, a, I think, a more complicated one, um, as a lot of a lot of institutions don't save things as triple F; they merely sort of uh, transform what's on their back end to triple F. Um, which makes you know the problem of what is the triple F document at the end a bit more complicated as uh, it would probably be transformed out of triple F at the other end, which again um, sort of conflicts with the interoperability part. And um, so I think lots of uh, open problems. Yeah, integrate uh, integration at the institution uh, level. Mm. Um, right, the questions are flying in now, sir. Um, uh, Joe suggested Elasticsearch might be a good option for storing the manifest, which is uh, always a good idea. Um, so next question was, what are some good API endpoints to download some IIIF annotated museum images to play around with and learn more? Um, I think we can maybe post a couple of the examples we've seen here from the VNA, if that would be useful to see the structures of the annotations. Um, I will post that in the chat just now. I, I guess the um, uh, awesome IIIF uh, GitHub repo might have some links that are useful. I can put that link in as well in the chat. Uh, next question, can the database be linked to open data so you can connect with other collections or institutions? If it's triple F, yes. Yeah. Oh, that was an easy one. Uh, next one uh, from uh, Adrian was, is it possible to take a spreadsheet of collection data with link to images in the rows and use editor to create multiple manifests for each row? Not currently, um, but I mean, it, it's not currently, uh, no. <laughs> it would require some yeah. development. Yeah, PRs, uh, pull requests are welcome on the GitHub repository. Would it? As always. And next question from uh, Frank, is there already a Lido import for IIIF? That's not really specifically for the manifest editor, I don't think. I don't think that is really because the, the metadata isn't really preserved in IIIF. No. No. Uh, I think that's all the questions. Yes, I'm still waiting for a feature from you, but you know, answer in your own times. You know, <laughs> one of the things that stuck with me is something we've discussed before, which is the uh, 360 degree images. Um, something I think is very important for museums to get a sense of exhibitions that are uh, is currently going on or that are in the past, maybe more especially, to give people a sense of what those ex exhibitions looked like because the huge amount of work that goes into setting them up and placing them and being able to see things in sort of 360 degrees, uh, I think would be 
would be fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, another question for you both. Is there an API for exporting the content, the scholarship and preserving the work product uh, from Sherry? So at the moment, um, what you can do with um, what you create in the, the manifest is um, download the, the JSON file um, to, to your computer. So, um, and then from there, you can do whatever you want with, with the IIIF. So it's not specific to any institution or, or anything like that. It's just purely a JSON file of IIIF. Right. Uh, and uh, Julian has helpfully given us an answer to the Lido question. So that's there for anyone who's wanted that. Uh, Another question from Joe on, can you put a soundtrack on the slide shows? I think so. Uh, maybe, maybe you can. You can, you can add a, um, an audio annotation and a video annotation onto the slideshow. Um, but as for an, an, an audio um, that will take you through the whole present presentation, N not currently, but I mean that would be a really cool feature to to ha to have you talk you um taken through the collection by by someone describing it. Um, yeah, that's a great idea for a feature. Okay, well Joe's given you your answer there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's some discussion in the presentation API three about that about the idea of a soundtrack that's not attached to any individual canvas. Um, because you don't want it to stop when you're moving through the canvases. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure if there is an outcome on that. Hopefully someone can answer on the Slack channel or chat. Uh, so I think that's all the questions and I think we need to move on to the last talk. So thank you both. And if you could uh, follow in the Slack channel if there's any other links you want to put in. Um, uh, and then uh, yeah, uh, I think in the chat as well, if that's useful to people following or any yeah. other chat communication system you think you might be looking for it. So thanks both. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks for having us. That's okay. And for the final talk, uh, once you've set up IIIF and you've created uh, the manifest, the obvious next step is to import your images into Animal Crossing. And luckily, uh, Selena and Kirsten from the Getty have built something that does just that for you. So uh, I'll hand it over to both of you. And again, I'm afraid, I don't know which of you is starting to talk. Uh, I'll be starting. So hello, <laughs> my name is Kristen. Um, I'm gonna set up my screen here really quick. Okay. And can everybody see my screen? Hopefully, yes. Um, so yep, yeah, so I am Kristen Carter. Uh, I am a UX designer at the Getty. And I'm Selena Zawacki. Uh, I'm a software engineer in the research application development department. And we're presenting the Animal Crossing art generator. So it's a project we created in April of this year and it makes it easy to bring Getty artwork and artwork from other institutions into the game Animal Crossing. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Animal Crossing New Horizons, it's a video game that was released in March, uh, which almost perfectly aligned with the beginning of most stay at home orders. Um, it's been treated as a peaceful escape where users can carefully plan out their own in-game island oasis, virtually hang out with uh, their real life friends and customize their surroundings. Uh, upon completion of the and launch of our project, there was no art museum in the game. Uh, they only had a natural history museum. And so that was the gap that we wanted to fill with our art generator. So we started our project by utilizing code from an open source app that already existed called the Animal Crossing Pattern Tool. So that's what's shown on the screen over here or a part of it. Um, it allows users to draw with a limited color palette or they can upload an image and it converts it into a QR code that they can use to get the image into the game. Uh, we took parts of the code and built on it, so namely the cropper, QR converter, and image export process. And from there we added the ability to search our collection, IIIF capabilities, and then our own user interface as well. 
So how does one go about creating their own virtual uh, Getty Museum on their digital island? Uh, allow me to show you that with our app and how it works. Um, and hopefully this demo will go off uh, without a hitch. So let's just bring that up here. All right. So uh, the first thing that you're going to need to do is to select a work of art, uh, which can be done one of three ways. If you know the art that you would like to add or want to take a stab in the dark at seeing what keywords might return in your results, you can start by uh, browsing the Getty Museum's open content. Uh, so just for instance, oops. So we have the results here, so I can select one. It'll take me down and I can see what this would look like uh, in game. Uh, the other way that I can do that is if you're you know, not sure where to start, uh, we have curated some of uh, Getty's favorite arts. Um, so you can just kind of browse through, select the one that you like the best and you can uh, play around with the cropper and it'll update in real time on the on the right there so and once uh, You know once you have your perfect artwork uh, You can download the QR code here to share on social media um, Or you can uh, scan it into the and then scan it into the game and then we have the uh, detailed instructions on uh, we did an iris post which details it all out if you don't know um, how to, uh, if you, because you'll need like the Nintendo Switch app. So it kind of goes through all of those details. Um, but let's say that the, the work of art that you want to import into your game is, is not from the Getty. Um, we've provided a way for users to do that uh, using IIIF from other museums by simply pasting uh, IIIF manifest URL. So if you scroll down, and let's see, let's put that there. So there we go, we've got a piece of artwork from the Smithsonian. Um, and you'll notice that not only does the, we have the logo here that updates, um, but it'll also update the attributions and license below the image as well. Um, and I didn't show that with the Getty images, but you can see that it'll update the title and the artist as well as give you a link to view that in our collection. Um, so that's so that's basically it. Uh, pretty easy, I think. Uh, so. Uh, so the idea for this project uh, was really motivated by a few key goals at the Getty. Um, where we are trying to work on expanding our online presence and reach. And part of this effort is the new experiments.getty.edu URL. At this URL, we hope to host more projects like the Art Generator that will showcase the technologies we've built and leveraged, the resources we provide, and as well as provide new ways for interacting with our collections. Uh, with this application specifically, uh, we wanted to create something that could uh, showcase the IIIF, techno uh, IIIF, a technology that's um, widely used, but maybe not as visible to the general public. Uh, we also wanted to create something that could be used by other institutions, which worked out pretty easily since we are building on a common technology. Um, so we use IIIF in multiple ways across this application. Uh, for all the artwork, we use the image API, uh, the main use of which was requesting the different sizes for thumbnails and the cropper preview. We also use IIIF manifest to import work from other institutions like Kristen showed you. So we extracted the data we needed from the manifest for the logo and titles and transformed it for use uh, on the QR code images. We, let's see, uh, and finally, we also use the IIIF content state, so the IIIF content URL for import and manifest, meaning somebody could link to our app uh, with the manifest URL populating, manifest populating URL already, so it would show up in the, cro uh, the cropper when the user gets there. So it could show an image from the Smithsonian as soon as they arrive on the page. 
Uh, we worked on the assumption that a large portion of our users would come to the app with no prior knowledge of IIIF, uh, because a lot of them would probably be Animal Crossing us users, not really intense uh, programmers or in the museum crowd, maybe. Uh, so we simplified the definition down to it's a technology for showing art online. And then we provided a few links to the IIIF.io website, which is a really good resource for explaining things, um, a list, we included a list of collections using IIIF, how to find a manifest, and the benefits of using IIIF. So how does a project like this get done? Uh, from the initial conception to the final launch of the project, uh, project planning and development took roughly a week. Um, our team was made up of three full stack devs building the view-based application, search functionality, and the IIIF features. Uh, one UX lead designing the look and feel and conducting rapid user testing, making sure the app met usability guidelines and as well as met the needs of our users. And then we had one social media liaison who was uh, working to perfect our copy as well as uh, plan and execute the social media strategy for our launch. So the launch of the art generator included two main methods of promotion, um, a thread posted from the Getty Museum Twitter, and then as Kristen mentioned as well, uh, a post on the IRIS, which is the Getty's behind the, muse uh, behind the scenes kind of museum blog. Uh, the blog post introduced the project and also included a detailed section showing step-by-step -step how to import an image into the video game by scanning the QR code on the phone and then linking that account with your switch and stuff like that. So we got rec recognition from several notable publications, including the LA Times, Hyperallergic, and Polygon, which is um, a popular news, game, news site for games and pop culture. Many of the publications, like we're showing in the slides here, uh, highlighted our use of IIIF, which is great for the community as a whole and institutions that are using the technology. And these are a handful of other pop, uh, online publications that featured our project. So they range from Forbes, which you all know, to technology sites like Gizmodo, and uh, gaming and pop culture sites like Eurogamer and Gigazine. One thing we made sure to include in our application was some simple analytics so that we could monitor how the site was performing. Uh, we launched on a Thursday, so a week after we started working on the project and had a few of course, very strong days and visitors continue to come in steadily through uh, the following week and still are visiting even now. Something that's really apparent from the graph that we're showing here is around April 18th, so a couple a day, I think, um, after we launched is that the site went down around 8 p.m. Friday to 10 a.m. Saturday um, with the dip in that graph. And that was something that our users on Twitter alerted us to through the Getty Museum Twitter. Um, so the site going down was due to a networking issue and we quickly got it back up. So after we launched, we conducted a quick postmortem in which we asked ourselves what we gained by completing this project. Uh, we realized that the art generator not only benefited the Getty, but it also benefited other museums. The project itself and the follow-up project and news articles really highlighted the fact that many museums have their collections open and available to the public. Uh, it also expanded our reach to a new set of users, um, mainly the Animal Crossing uh, gaming community, and encouraged new interaction with museum collections, which resulted in a large amount of user-generated content being shared across social media. And then finally, it provided the Getty and other institutions with a fun alternative and pop culture relevant way to share images from their collection. We ended up learning a lot from this uh, one week project. So from working with IIIF specifically from multiple institutions at once, we learned that uh, first it's often tricky for users to find out how to get manifest URLs from different institutions. And this does include the Getty. So we learned that we should make finding manifests easier and more apparent for people who are interested in it. Uh, we also learned that cross origin resource sharing or cores uh, should be enabled for logos and manifests. So while working on our project, if it wasn't enabled, we weren't able to include the institution's logo on that um, generated image for people to share. Uh, we also found out that the information under the rights and attribution could be a little bit inconsistent between institutions and that it should allow users ideally to understand what they can do with 
uh, an image pretty easily. We also learned some things uh, from working on such a short timeline. Uh, we found that it was easier to create something relevant that was trending, which as you've seen has its benefits. Uh, less than a week later on our project wouldn't have seemed nearly as exciting because Animal Crossing itself announced the addition of an art museum uh, to its existing in-game natural history museum. Uh, we also realized that testing is still important, uh, both with users uh, and inside the application code itself. While we did some quick user tests uh, towards the end, we might have been able to make a few additional changes to improve the UI and the experience overall had we done this a little bit earlier and more often. Uh, some of the technical issues discovered after launch, we were happy to rely on our users to let us know that something was wrong. However, for future projects, we should provide a clear way to get uh, that feedback from our users. Uh, as Selena said, we had a lot of our bug reports and questions coming through the at Getty Museum Twitter. Uh, so thank you all so much for letting us talk about this. Uh, for those who are interested in checking out the app for yourself, uh, feel free to visit us at experiments.getty.edu slash AC Art Generator. And if you need more information on the behind the scenes of the app and the instructions on how to get the Nintendo Switch app uh, to import the artwork that you've created, then as we've mentioned before, you can visit our Iris blog post about how to build an art museum in Animal Crossing. So thank you all so much. Great, thank you both. Um, we're getting some appreciation in the Q&A already for people who love uh, Animal Crossing and the art generator. Um, so if uh, we have a couple of minutes left, if there's any more questions, but I'll ask one while uh, the questions come in, which is, are you both still personally addicted to playing Animal Crossing or do you never want to see it again? Uh, I still play it. I think it's uh, a lot of fun. So it hasn't ruined the, that experience for me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> right. And it's interesting with the, when they brought art into the game, I think, like you say, that was quite an unexpected thing, and it's uh, it's a bit of a curious thing now about what artworks they are using within the game themselves. I, I don't know what rights information uh, they have been looking at. I'm sure it's all uh, perfectly uh, valid, though. Uh, so, um, all right, more people saying how much they love the art generator. Um, so. Um, are there any other features that you think you might be adding to it? Um, there are a few if we get the chance to go back. Um, one is that although we display the rights and attribution, we don't actually do a check for it. So a user can technically, even though we put a warning, you know, in bold font, don't use an image that's not open content, they could technically uh, import an image that's not open content. Uh, another issue we've run into is that because we built this on such a quick timeline, we should have done more testing, but we don't actually check for the version of IIIF that we're using, so, uh, or that an imported manifest might be using, so there could be some issues with that, depending on which version, um, but in general, it seems to be working for most people. Okay, and um, I'm just, uh, someone's asking about uh, a link to that, so I'm just putting a link into the site. Um, the, um, Thing we found when trying to use it was that um, it, it, uh, anything three-dimensional doesn't really work. Uh, really, it has to be flat objects uh, because of the resolution. I don't know if you've tried anything, uh, sculptural things or anything like that, if you think there's any way to bring those into the game. We actually, no, we, we haven't tried anything aside from images of, you know, vases in our collection. We haven't tried with many 3D objects, so that's a good good point to try. Yeah, that'd be really nice if uh, you could bring in the whole of the collection, not just the, the flat stuff. <laughs> um, I, I think we're almost out of time, so if there's anyone, any more questions, so I'm just checking, I have, remember I have to check the Slack channel as well. Uh, so more people appreciating it and also people curious about the computers behind you or whether they work or not. Um, they do both work. One of them's a ADM 3A. It's a terminal, so it's just more of a display. And then back there is the um, 
Apple IIe, so, and that does work. You can play games like Adventure on it. Excellent. <laughs> uh, well, thanks both for that. And uh, I look for, I will be playing Animal Crossing still myself and importing images using the uh, generator. Uh, cheers. Thanks. And I hope more features come to it soon. <laughs> um, so we're almost out of time. Thanks to all the speakers. Um, like to remind everyone that we have a monthly uh, museum group call. The next one will be on the 7th of July, uh, speakers to be announced and links for that will be in the museum group Slack channel and uh, on various uh, other uh, IFFF accounts. Uh, uh, please do sign up for the Slack uh, and uh, there's a mailing list as well and uh, yeah uh, lots of other ways you can reach the museum group and uh, hopefully share your experiences with using IFFF. So that's it, I think, for the session now. And uh, I think there is another session about to start on uh, Mirador uh, in a, another Zoom call. So um, maybe see some of you up for that. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.